Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and uh, we are back at uh, the series that we have entitled, uh, or titled, I should say, "The Origins of the Name of Muhammad." And I, when I say "we," I'm referring to myself and our dear brother Mel, who is joining me here remotely to discuss uh, in various episodes things related to the origin of the name Muhammad. And I think you are, uh, meaning me, you, the viewer, is going to find it really an eye-opener, and hopefully you'll find it even an exciting uh, video series. Last time we did just a, a quick overview of what to expect. Today we're going to dive into the first episode where we begin to take a deep dive on the origin of this name. Uh, Mel, uh, how are you, my friend? And I'm going to turn it over to you to take it from here. Um, I'm, I'm great, and thank you for uh, having me back. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the origin of Muhammad in the Bible. Now, this is a, kind of a hot topic because on one side, Muslims will say Muhammad is in the Bible and therefore he's prophesied. And on the other hand, there are people who would say, no, 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 uh, Muhammad isn't in the Bible. It's The term is being misinterpreted. So I'm actually going to be taking a third point of view on this and uh, looking at exactly in what sense is Muhammad in the Bible. So to do so, first of all, I want to note that Hamad is the Hebrew root of Mahmud. Now, from here on in, I'm going to be referring to Muhammad really as Mahmud, which is the actual way it's given in the Quran, if you take out the vocalization. And what does that Hebrew root mean? It means desired. So we have two occurrences of Hamad in Psalm 68.16. Um, we can see there which God has desired for his abode and the wicked man desires the booty in Proverbs 12.12. 12. Hamad is rendered Ahmed in the Quran. So Ahmed and Hamad is essentially the same word and it right. means desired. Okay. But we also have another word which is maybe sounds closer to Muhammad for us, which is in the Song of Songs 516. And that word is Muhammadim, which literally means lovely. Um, it's also important to note that it is associated with the Messiah. And I'm giving credit to Professor Robert Kerr, who pointed this out to me. Um, so let's look at an example of how this word was interpreted as referring to the Messiah from Christian tradition. So I'm going to refer to St. Ambrose's writing. Uh, he wrote this in 387 AD. He interprets the Song of Songs as being about Jesus and his church. So if we take Song of Songs 5, the first verse, we have Jesus talking, and, and in, that's according to his interpretation. I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk. So St. Ambrose quotes that and then he says, Understand you faithful why he spoke of meat and drink. And there is no doubt that he himself eats and drinks in us. As you have read that he says that in our persons he is in prison. Okay. So going a little bit further then. We can see here that the church refers to Jesus. If we look at verse 16 of the same uh, same chapter, the church refers to Jesus as altogether lovely. So Muhammadim is referring to Jesus as the altogether lovely. So that's how Christians for centuries before Islam interpreted it. So now there is a question of the, the word Muhammadim, it's plural. It's a Hebrew plural. Um, there is a dispute about this, but um, Islamic critiqued um, gave me information that this was a poetic intensification. Sometimes plurals are used to, to basically um, emphasize the adjective. Um, but the key thing to draw from this is that we have Muhammadim in reference to Jesus, the Messiah. So this is a problem for Muslims. If Muslims want to say Muhammad is in the Bible, well, the problem is that for centuries, this was used in the sense of Messiah. Now, Jews 
also see this word Muhammadim as a reference to the Messiah. Obviously, they reject Jesus as the Messiah, but both Jews and Christians have this common interpretation of the word of Muhammadin as Messiah. I just send it back to you, um, Al. Any any thoughts? Let me let me uh, you know play the devil's advocate. What if someone say, okay, well, I see that the church interpreted this way, and I see that. Uh, um, uh, Saint um, Ambrose and others like him interpreted that way. But what if, what if they weren't clear yet because they did not know about Muhammad? And now Muhammad came into the scene, and all of a sudden now people are realizing, oh, so Muhammad is the fulfillment, the actual physical fulfillment of this. Well, I, I suppose if someone was a claimant to the Messiah, so if you imagine a group who were like a hybrid between Jews and Christians, which is what I believe founded Islam ultimately. Um, if they're making a claim that they are the Messiah, the, the 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 one that's expected to come, they would have to use that term for themselves. And that's what it seems to have happened. Um, whoever it was that stepped forward in the seventh century um, would have used that term if they thought they, they were the Messiah. Now, what's interesting is there was a Jewish person back in 135 AD called Bar Kokhba, and he led a rebellion against the Romans at that time. And many Jews considered that he was the Messiah, except his mission failed and he got killed. And so they kind of dropped it and said, well, we thought he was the Messiah, but it turned out he wasn't. Now, what's interesting is that 500 years later was the anniversary of that. So 635 AD. And what we find is this coincides nicely with the Arab um expansion um, that went through Iraq and into um, Palestine. And we have people like Umar that emerge. And it's interesting, if we tie that up with the um, Thomas the Presbyter, it refers to someone in 634, exactly the same year as Umar was made leader, and, and refers to him as the uh, Tataye of Mahmed. Um, so we, we can see that the term was being used in a messianic sense on the 500th anniversary or thereabouts, on the eve of the 500th anniversary of uh, the first attempt at setting up a messiah. Um, there could easily have been multiple attempts at uh, creating a messiah in that century. Like, for example, back in 617, there would have been um, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem, um, and so that could have been another opportunity for someone to claim to be the Mah Muhammad or the Mahmud, but that wasn't entirely successful. So there was another attempt again in the 630s. Uh, this time it was successful. Um, but you really don't know how successful the whole attempt is until decades have passed. And I believe that it was really in the 8th century where uh, things started to settle down and people particularly Arabs, considered the conquest to have been successful. And then they, they started backdating the term Mahmud on someone in the 7th century, possibly uh, Umar, but maybe it was um, not a good enough person. Maybe they backdated earlier. Um, uh, but we have that Arab um, prophet of the 7th century connected with that term Mahmud, the, the Messiah. So I'm going to just remind everyone that in the Bible, the, the sense of the word uh, Mahmudim is really the Messiah. Right. And, and uh, you. You know, an, another uh, argument I can raise now, even though I played the devil's advocate earlier, I mean, like verse 16 in chapter 5 of Songs of Solomon, uh, it says this, his mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. So here is a description of the person, not the name. And then there is an invocation here to a group called the Daughters of Jerusalem. So right there, I would ask the Muslims, did Muhammad even ever make it to Jerusalem? Did Muhammad even ever came first to the Jews and then to the pagans, if you wish? If you would have said, well, he came to the Jews and the Jews re rejected him. And that is therefore uh, he went back and now uh, preached to the Gentiles, if you wish, or the pagans. No, we don't find any evidence of this at all. And then, uh, Mel, have you ever done a study? I mean, and we have two minutes left, by the way. Have you ever done a study uh, on when did this idea 
came about by the Muslims. Like, was it in the 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, when they began to claim that this is about Muhammad? Yeah, I was reading um, uh, some articles by uh, Oleg um, recently, and his suggestion is it was in the 8th century when the term got transferred to um, uh, an Arabian prophet. Uh, up to then, there was even a term Mahmed Jesus that was being used, according to him, up to the 700s, and then gradually died out. And it seems to be, according to him, that it was when the Persians became more influential, they weren't all that um, happy about the whole Christian thing. And he basically, the the association with Jesus was basically pushed out, and what was left was this Arabian prophet. And then we have all the creation of the Hadiths around that time, um, and the inscriptions that seem to be pointing to a, 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 an Arabian prophet all started to happen around the 730s. So we're talking about the 8th century or 100 right. years after after the time. Um, and it's interesting, the connection with Jerusalem as well is important because the Messiah had to be Jewish. <laughs> this is a major problem. But Jews and Christians are clear about this. The Messiah has to be Jewish. Now, for Christians... The Messiah has come and we're expecting Jesus to return at the end of time. Um, right. For Jews, it's, they're still waiting for a Messiah, but he must, to be accepted as a Messiah, he must be Jewish. And that's a major problem for Muslims because if, if they want to claim that Muhammad was an, uh, an Arabian pagan who uh, got this revelation, well, sorry, he doesn't qualify as a Messiah. He has to be Jewish, and that's a major problem. Absolutely, and I want to wrap it up by saying... Uh, that these are, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the usual movements by cults and heresies where you try to find something that is legit and you spin it and you start to apply it to something that has nothing to do with the original meaning whatsoever. Thank you, Mel, and I appreciate you. And I know in the next episode, we are going to carry on this conversation. We're going to talk about Oleg, I believe that's, uh, uh, you know, what your intention is to do. And then people will take a look at even, uh, you know, the origin of this name predates even Christianity um, as well. So thank you for the research. Thank you, everyone, uh, for watching. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless.